Hello everyone, uh, I want to welcome you to this um, Coding Serbia meetup powered by Codecentric. Uh, tonight we're going to have two different subjects. Uh, one is uh, related to project management, that's uh, agile with emphasis on the no projects. And one is um, JavaScript testing. Uh, before we start, I want to uh, Welcome you all and thank you for coming. And I want to bring your attention to uh, that um, Coding Serbia conference tickets are now available and the, the, they are currently available for early bird prices. So uh, you can visit the Coding Serbia web website and uh, you can purchase tickets for, uh, for uh, early bird price in a limited period of time. Um, my name is Rastko, I'm um, uh, your guest speaker tonight, and uh, this is uh, my subject tonight. I work for uh, VAS.com in front, their front-end team in Belgrade. I uh, develop applications in uh, Node.js and JavaScript, so full-stack uh, JavaScript applications. And uh, if you need any clarifications or anything uh, regarding the code examples in the, what I'm going to be speaking about tonight, tonight this evening, you can uh, visit uh, GitHub, my GitHub account and see what's, uh, uh, see exact code examples there. So my Twitter is uh, at uh, Rasko with underscore after it, so you can reach me there also. Uh, I'm sorry for this digression. I was a little confused. I forgot the, the, the main thing about the uh, Coding Serbia conference. So uh, that's conference uh, oriented towards uh, software development and especially uh, big data and uh, DevOps. And there will be a big emphasis on Agile there, like this evening. And uh, there will be workshops in big data technologies and workshops in uh, all kinds of uh, DevOps stuff. And we're going to have a great workshop in uh, Agile. So uh, that's, uh, that's it regarding the Coding Serbia conference. I hope I didn't forget anything this time. So uh, to continue with the with uh, my talk, um, how many software developers in the audience tonight? OK. That's uh, not what I expected. I expected more like agile people, less developers. OK, and who uses, uh, since JavaScript is kind of a subject, who uses JavaScript in day-to-day uh, -day development? OK, that's, uh, that's cool. So. Uh, what uh, we are going to talk about is uh, testing JavaScript and testing in JavaScript, as in uh, testing with tools that are written in JavaScript. So can you tell me how many people here uh, test their code? Do you do any kind of testing? Yeah, actually, not true. All the hands that went up when I asked about software development for the hands that were supposed to be up when I asked about testing. Because the, the, the basic thing is, what you don't do is automated testing. You have to test what you do. Like, you, you do it manually, but you do through um, REPL or through debugger or through whoever does web, clicking through pages and seeing how stuff does. But what we need to do is automate these tests so we can like save time and like save money because everyone is talking about uh, like what's the value of testing and value is great, tests can save you, etc., etc. And everyone is talking about test-driven development. So basically, 
you um, buy the specs that you get, you write tests, then you write code to pass those tests, and then when the tests are passed, you can be confident that those tests are not just going to show you that you did the work good, that you finished, but they're going to show you the state of your application, the state of your code in any given time on build or whenever you want to run tests. So what we want to ask ourselves is, uh, well, it's not a question. It's like a more of a conclusion. We want to say like, so OK, all automated tests are unit tests, right? So that's probably the, the wrong thing, the, the wrongest thing. Because what we want to test is not just a unit of code, not just implementation. We want to test, well, in my opinion, three categories of things. So we want to test units of code. We want to test the implementation. We want to test integration or how those like assemble together. And we want to do acceptance tests. Acceptance tests are uh, almost always the tests that people did that did not bring their head up do. So like you sit down, you look at the specification, you look at what you've done, you, what you've done and you say, OK. And then you test it manually and say, OK, this will do. That's it. I did it. And that's cool. OK. So that's acceptance tests. And we also call it functional tests. And we're going to like uh, automate those also. So problem is not uh, automation of stuff. Automation of stuff is always available to you. You can automate any kind of test. You can even search a GitHub for stuff that you want automated and it will immediately bring up uh, automation um, libraries that can help you with any of these tests. But how do we use that? That's uh, like final subject of this testing session. It's more of a testing discussion since it's not, it's not live coding session, but never mind that. So talking concepts or continuing talking concepts. If we want to test our code, what we know is that it needs to be uh, like unit of code. It needs to be some unit of implementation. So you have to think hard to know what actually unit of implementation is and what does it mean to you. But it also needs to be completely isolated. So you can have isolated case that you test. You can bring anything you want on it and see how it behaves. And uh, you need not to be dependent on any outside factor. So isolation and uh, what's the unit and one thing that I'm not mentioning all this time because there is another type of testing, as they say. It's behavioral testing, and uh, it's not a type of testing. That's why it's not in the list. It's know-how for unit testing. So that's how it teaches you how to figure out what's the way you want to approach your unit of code. So when you unit test, you need to test more of a behavior than uh, of uh, implementation itself but because sometimes or most of the time, especially in the web development, uh, implementation itself uh, does not mean a thing without uh, behavior and integration. So when talking about uh, behavioral tests, there is a well-known Jasmine framework for, uh, for um, JavaScript. And, um, we want to integrate it and test the client-side and server-side code in JavaScript, so we want to use some kind of uh, Node.js implementation. What I use here is Jasmine Node. Jasmine Node is implementation that runs on Node.js and runs tests in Jasmine and allows you to uh, dictate all kinds of stuff uh, like uh, outputs, types of outputs, Etc. So we're going to use Jasmine node to run these tests, just so you know why its output is in the terminal, not in the browser, as uh, it usually is in those runners 
or it's in the Karma runner or something like that, but it's usually in the runners. So this is how it looks like. And this is where testing the behavior begins. What I want you to note here is that this describer actually describes uh, behaviors of a method that we want to test. This is the part that, it's, that is just a concept and illustration, and we want to test some API call method that does the call to a server or a certain endpoint of uh, API. And what it needs to do, it needs to, in um, like first describer, it needs to return an object on response success. So like when it's 200 uh, status code, and then it should return error object if it's 400 to 500, some kind of an error. And then two other behaviors are that it triggers a logger. Since it's server side thing, it needs to trigger a logger that's uh, when on server, it writes to our syslog. When you are developing being in your dev environment, you're going to see stuff in your, um, your terminal window. That's it. And isolation. So uh, what I'm using here is uh, Nog.js. That's it's like Truman Show for network requests. One of the best, uh, let's say, route interceptors, API route, or uh, request, actually, HTTP request interceptors there is. So you can check it out on GitHub. It's just Node.js, and you can use it from npm and knock yourself out. So how does it work? You can be really, really particular with it. I'm going to just go quickly through it. It uh, in um, aspect of, like, if we look through it, through our tests, you can see that uh, this is the example that we're going to use to mock the request uh, responses for our tests. So we're going to pass exact options for the API call that we want to use on our method that we're building. So that's why options host and options path. So we are in intercepting the same path over and over again because we're going to pass the same options over and over again. And we're just going to return stuff. We're going to return first 200 that you wanted to test then 400 with an error, and then two errors, two consecutive errors after that. What's to be noted here is first, knock stops working after uh, using all the stuff that it has in the interception buffer or interception stack or whatever you want to call it. Another is second parameter can actually be a callback. So you can write a function there and uh, write a behavior. Or you can uh, read a file from this, can return it. So you can emulate streaming of data. This is really important thing because you can use knock on it for itself and test your other applications that are not JavaScript related by uh, using Knox server and just uh, doing interceptions or all the various stuff that you use. You can write any link you want, and it uh, like intercepts uh, real stuff. It does not have to be uh, www.fakeapi.com. It, it can be google.com, googleapi.com, or whatever else. You, can, you just need to be particular about it, like we um, talked about concepts of uh, this kind of testing. So this is uh, how our tests should look like. Uh, briefly, again, it will call the method in every test. And then in the callback, it should expect, in the first two, it should expect certain object to have, uh, have a certain thing in it. And for uh, other two that's interesting, it expects that certain uh, method is going to be called in first test. And in second test, it expects that, that certain uh, method should be called with uh, string error happened. So uh, for this, for us to see this, we need this spice. For, the, for particular methods, we set up the global namespace. The quantum that you've seen before is a global namespace for my boilerplate. So these examples are for the, from the thing that actually works. I take a logger from Singleton that's set up in a global scope. So that's it. You just use it to 
create a spy on a certain place and then say, tell it that it needs to call fake thing. So it does not call a logger, it calls, it calls actual method that we pass it and in one case it says, says hello from info, in other case it says hello from error. And uh, what we do, we write this code just to accommodate for, uh, for tests or I said this intentionally, as you've seen, so we are writing code for, actually, for it actually to do, do something, but in this case we have completely isolated things, so we are writing the, the code to pass the tests that we, that we wrote. So this is, the, this is the actual code that does it. We have handling for a full range between 400 and 500, and we have success thing, and we see that uh, if error happens, it first calls error happened, which we actually test, and uh, that's it. Our tests passed, and we have uh, output before the, the test uh, info or report, we got, um, uh, we got all the logging from the fake functions. This is like important thing to test, but uh, with a little change, we can actually, I'm sorry about this. Okay, with a little change in code, we can test how stuff integrates at the same time. So what do we do? We replace stubs and mocks with uh, real stuff. So we have a global namespace, we set the actual logger plugin in it, and we set uh, API call and whatever we need to test. And instead of all those mocks and spies, we just replace it with a simple spy that says spy on quantum logger, which is like global quantum logger, the, the one that's in global namespace, and spy on its info and call true, which, which means it lets the, the request or your uh, function call, method call, propagate to a real thing. And then there's a test that already passed, but we wanna test how it integrates, and here's the, the real thing. So why don't test logger itself? The, the thing is that uh, it, there it's for, for stuff like loggers and that kind of stuff, the actual integration is what matters. And what I wanna tell you is not that you need to test everything, but you need to like go through stuff and kind of triage, but it's not like triage, something died and then you do it, but it's kind of a thing where you need tests, but if it's that kind of thing that I hear every day, like who has time for tests or you find time and you write me tests, you need to at least test this kind of stuff because that's the, the thing, those are the things that are showing the working state of your application. And that's what we want to do. We want to have something that, that's the essential for uh, always seeing the working state of uh, what we are working on. So about units and systems, I already started on that. Uh, unit testing can be like when somebody makes you unit test everything. So you have code coverage 80% or build does not pass. It does not mean that your tests are valid after next implementation or refactoring or stuff like that. That's why we have behavioral driven testing. We need to pay close attention to our methods. We cannot generate tests. We need to pay close attention to what we want to test and then test that behavior. It will mean less tests, less time, but like more quality reports on what we did because like 80% code coverage does not mean anything, especially if you, when you refactor something or you use the wrapper, like I use a logger there, that's a wrapper around the logger module that has the same interface, so I keep the interface, change something that's inside and it works. Sometimes when you set test stuff like that with generic tests or tests that are written just to pass code coverage uh, situation, you need to change tests after you change something in the code. That's something that's obviously completely wrong and not needed better. Don't have tests, 
then have tests that you need to change whenever you change something in the code. You don't change tests, you just change code. So better test integration because, well, uh, integration tests are closer to behavioral tests, so for small stuff, testing integrations means testing behavior, so that's what we need to think about, about the units of code and assemblies. And uh, that's basically the, the thing about testing the code itself. So another thing, acceptance tests or functional tests, that's the also broad or broader subject here. So uh, this is like that high level concept that I was talking about, so testing in JavaScript, but not explicitly JavaScript. We, here, we are more based on web interfaces that all of our applications have. So, uh, examples will be written in Node.js and uh, Phantom.js or Casper.js that actually allows us to run Phantom and Slimmer, which are WebKit and uh, Gecko headless browsers, which will then allow us, of course, to uh, write uh, functional or acceptance tests and run them into engines, again, allowing us to, to, better, to have a better perspective on how our application works. So, uh, what do we automate? Again, uh, we are automatically testing something that absolutely defines working state of our application. So those are like, first thing of those is uh, those smoke tests, sniff tests, or bubble tests, or whatever you want to call them, and then any other test that uh, you think that's going to help you figure out if your application or your new feature is passing the acceptance criteria. But let's, let's first talk and uh, let's focus on those uh, s like functioning tests or smoke tests, tests that are showing us if it works at all. Sorry about this, again. So here is the code is Casper that's probably self-explanatory enough. You just uh, go to some uh, web page, so it's probably a web page of your application, and then you fill the form and you log in, and after logging in, you check if uh, three main containers in the page are there. And you echo stuff in the terminal. So what happens here? You test if stuff is there. That's cool, but the uh, question is, uh, do you need the tests like this? I want you to think about if uh, there's a better way of testing this, because uh, if we test it like this, we need to see the results in the terminal, and uh, ultimately, you can just click in the browser, thank you, <laughs> You can just click in the browser and you have saved password, you just click, you see, oh, everything is there, that's cool. So that's why this part where, where you can put any code there, right? So uh, I want to show you another smoke test or another test that can show you the working state of your application and then we will come to that part of... <laughs> That, uh, that part of code that I've been talking about that it will make your life easier and that's pretty easy to use. So, if you look at this code, we are doing basically the same thing, but I want to introduce additional stuff to it. So, this is like configured code. You need, first thing you need to have to automate something is um, ability to configure everything. So as you see here, we are doing a Casper each for each page after logging in, of course. First thing you see is that we come to a page that's login address in a config and we fill in the login form, add login credentials, and then after that, we iterate through pages that are pre-configured and for each page, we are setting a viewport and taking a screenshot for it. That's the test that we are doing. Something that I call 
uh, mobile or responsive smoke test. And uh, I'm always pointing there, I'm sorry. So this is a snapshot function. I'm just unboxing what you saw. It's not too important. As I've said, you can uh, look at it uh, on my uh, GitHub account. But uh, what it basically does, it uses Casper to set up all this stuff for us. Important thing would probably be the screenshot folder and, uh, and the wait uh, time. Screenshot folder, folder where all the screenshots go, obviously and uh, wait time if we uh, have an application or a web page that uh, on load, uh, when loaded, has some stuff loading asynchronously, we know that we have to wait a couple of seconds for it to be done. So we can pass, like, wait for five seconds for big images to be lazy loaded or something like that. So that's uh, basically that. It sets up uh, the viewport and takes a screenshot. So it turns the JSON form viewports into uh, real screenshots. And what you can see here is uh, this Agile Live podcast web page that's actually uh, screenshotted with this application. I think this is in Slimmer, in Gecko, but does not uh, need to mean anything at this point. You can see that uh, we can see the, the minor stuff or the big stuff. We can actually see what fails and then fix it. And uh, this is uh, actually a good uh, thing for uh, like an exa example of special kinds of testing that we can do if we have automated tests. We don't need to always go through all devices or always go to our browser and uh, use different sizes and different uh, browsers to test this. We can automate this and then look at it, which is good, but it's not uh, actual. This is uh, like uh, distraction from the thread of this talk because this cannot be automated further. This is the, the final thing. You still need to go through screenshots. But what I wanted to tell you is that if you have a test like this, you can really quickly, this is done in the background, you just trigger it by pressing a button or something, and then you just look through a screenshot, all the screenshots, and you can see that your site is not optimized for a width of uh, 240 pixels, or you can see that you have uh, nothing of importance above the fold uh, in the 360, 640 landscape. So something like that. But to return to automation itself and to uh, something that you can really do with these tests, apart from uh, checking if elements are there, clicking through stuff, you can automate anything in these uh, headless browsers. You can uh, read texts, you can crawl pages, whatever you need that's doable. But uh, I want to mention other types of tests. So one of the most important things in the web development is speed nowadays. And one of the uh, best tools for checking the speed and getting the recommendations on improving the speed is YSlow. And I want to show you uh, two other tests, one that's showing the cache analysis of the page and uh, one that's showing uh, resource analysis. So time to first byte, so when page starts really loading for the user and the resource in general. So these are the, this is how the reports look. So that's, that's what it all looks like. Of course that you can't read it, neither do I. I hope that I'm pointing at the right thing. At the uh, upper right corner, that's the cache analysis. So list of resources that are cached and that are not cached. And uh, down at the bottom, you can see the YSlow report that we're going to uh, take on later on and see how it actually works in our final implementation. And on the right, we can see a time to first byte analysis. If you look at the, this part here, you can see a waterfall chart that tells you this is where all the stuff started loading after initial load of the page. And then we can see everything is parallel, so nothing to really improve there. But we see uh, under there, we can see the speed of all the resources and all the like sizes and everything that we need. So this is just an example. Uh, but uh, the thing is that these two tools are also like uh, most of the stuff that's available in this uh, like uh, branch of testing. Most of them need to be run through Phantom JS or Casper JS. So 
importance of this is that uh, we, we can see how, uh, how automatically generated stuff works and that we do not have to run this stuff in terminal one by one. So what do we do? Running stuff would go like this. You write an uh, uh, array of, uh, I'm sorry, I cannot, uh, uh, we have high luminosity situation here, so my laser is a little, yeah. So um, we have an array of arguments that we want to pass to our uh, command line interface tool, like uh, PhantomJS or CasperJS. And then we uh, have a task runner that's actually a part of a task runner. This is how single task is run. So we go like why slow task is run phantom child process and we pass why slow arcs to it. And then we unreference it. Unreferencing line is important because in Node.js you get an ability to uh, have a parent process and then run each of the processes like uh, iterate through config and run everything. And ev when everything is running, the parent process dies and lets everything else like die consequently when it's done and not wait for the parent process to end. And everything gets uh, garbage collected really fine in Node.js. So that's one of the abilities of um, like writing one of the advantages on, on writing this uh, this stuff in Node.js. And the important thing down below on the last lines is that on STD out, we take the data and we do something with it. In this case, YSlow does the job for us, so it just outputs the string as it needs to be. We just need to write it to file. So like for a screenshots, I want to show you how it looks like. So ran, uh, we ran phantom child process to uh, run phantom child process method that actually utilizes child process module from Node.js. And we execute uh, fan, uh, phantom path. So we have uh, configured where our phantom JS is and we use it to run uh, something with the arguments passed. Uh, to, just to remind you, arguments for while slow path, which is so while slow uh, needs to be run through Phantom, and we have a page link that's configured. An important argument is that tap one, because uh, that's test anything protocol it's called. It's the form of output data that's really simple, and it's something like a JUnit report form, but a lot simpler and lots easier for people that uh, just want to write quick stuff to, to write. So this is uh, the, the below part is to file function. We want it to work on the, or I wanted it to work on Phantom and on Node.js wherever I run it because there are Phantom tests that are run and there are outputs that are caught in Node. So I have to have the detection whether the method is called from node or from phantom, which is done by detecting if there's is file method. And then if it's its file, it's phantom, we just write easily like it's shown. And in Node.js, it's more complicated stuff to do to detect if file is there and then write it or append it depending on uh, what uh, the, the status of existence of a file. So final thing that we want to achieve here. We want to be configured our runner. We know how to run stuff. We can iterate through our config and then run these uh, uh, different jobs, run these specifications or manifests in Casper that are going through our application, clicking and uh, like taking snapshots of stuff. But we want to like converge all the stuff to this single point where we can see the status of our application. Because everything about the testing is making it easy for us, not just having to run unit tests and then having to run integration tests and having to run all kinds of acceptance tests and then like figuring out what to do with them. We want to write everything down in the same form. So that's why this, why or any other code we want to trigger here. We, just, we can just trigger the to file function and write the simple report like this. This is the tap form. 
it just says on the right, the little square on the right, it just says we have three tests. One is okay, one is, two is not okay, three is okay. We give it some test, text and uh, that's it. We even have, I think the, the third thing is bail and there are other things, but uh, you can check it out on the TAP or uh, TAP uh, website for the specification for these tests. Why are we doing this exactly? We want to generate something like this. Code is small, but it's bigger than the, on the last slide that you've seen it. It's, uh, it's that while slow report that has uh, 24 points, if you can see up there, one up to 24, and it goes and it gives messages and it gives statuses for all kinds of uh, uh, performance analysis from your page and all kinds of uh, recommendations for fixing it. And uh, then, the, the final thing that you can do with these reports is integrate them with your um, co um, continuous integration tool. So you can use a tech, uh, tap uh, plugin for the Jenkins or for Team CT or for whatever you use. And on build, you can uh, read the specific tap files from your test results and show them in your continuous integration tool. So ultimately, we have a continuous integration process that uh, after on builds or even builds are ran on uh, command line interface tools. So uh, we are running command line interface tools that, that are uh, configured and are like what we, we can put anything we like in configs if it's custom enough. We can test anything we want. We can integrate all the tests into one CLI runner, and then it can be automatically triggered on build, on push, or whatever we need. And uh, the point of this session is actually to show you that the, the tests are, uh, not that tests are important. We know the tests are important, but the tests will bring you good if, they, if you write just a couple of them. Not, you don't need to have like this big code coverage, you just need to test smart. The, the thing with smart testing is not just that we have to sit down and figure out what we wanna test, is in the other aspect, how we wanna want our tests to be integrated into our process and how we wanna finally access the results of our tests. If you, if you can bring all the key tests together and their reports give the same form of output and you figure out what fails your build and what needs to send you an email or uh, calls you by the phone if you have some artificial intelligence or whatever else, if you can do that, then uh, you're cool even if you have three tests because it can actually become four and five and 25 and we can get the full coverage of a working state of your application in uh, like in no time. So Im important thing to remember here is automation and uh, testing the real working state of the application, not just uh, little pieces of code. That's actually all I had for this talk.